So um, my name is Nelson Santos, and I'm on one of the TAs for CS109, uh, and I will be doing this week's lab. This lab is lab two. Uh, it's going to deal mostly with data engineering, uh, which is actually um, acquiring the data from the web, uh, parsing it, and putting it into a structure that we can actually use for the um, for the data analysis. Uh, we're gonna. The only requirement for uh, for this class for this lab is going to be beautiful soup, which should already be installed um, from uh, from uh, lab one and homework zero. The there's also on when, once you go into the page uh, to download the homework. Uh, to, I'm sorry, to download the, the lab. Uh, you're gonna have um, access to those requirements and how to install them in case you haven't yet. Okay. So as I said, data engineering uh, is the way that we actually get the data that we're going to need into the, the structures that we're going to use. Uh, it's actually, unless you're dealing with very sp specific uh, data sets, it's what you're going to be uh, doing most of the time when working with data science. Uh, a lot of times, either the, the data set that you need is uh, on a format that's not compatible, or you're going to need to mix it with some other data set um, to get the information that you need. And again, you're going to have to normalize that data and do at least a uh, minimal amount of pro uh, processing. Uh, for this lab, uh, we're going to be getting the, some data from the Harvard uh, University um, Wikipedia page and parsing that. Um, specifically, we're going to select the table, um, the HTML table from one of the HTML tables from that, uh, that page and uh, add it to a data frame. That would all make more sense once we go through it. Okay, so the first library that we're going to be using is the uh, import library. I'm sorry, the uh, request library. The uh, request library is, it's basically a, a wrapper, an abstraction on top of the basic uh, Python um, uh, H HTTP, I'm sorry, HTTP uh, libraries, which are URL lib, uh, there's the URL lib, URL lib two, three, and I think there's even a four. Uh, those are great libraries, but they're very low level. I mean, um, in Python terms, they're very low level and they make it harder for you to do some complex um, requests. For what we'll be using, uh, URL lib would definitely be uh, usable. It would be very easy to, to uh, replace requests with URL lib. However, in the future, uh, for, for other assignments or when you're dealing with APIs, that you're going to have to actually log into the page, either using basic authentication or some kind of formal authentication using post. Uh, the request is going to make your life easier, so it's better to just get used to it right now. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do here is the uh, request the actual page that we're interested in. Uh, in this case, as I said, it's just the Wikipedia page for Harvard University. Uh, the the way that we do this is using using the uh, the get um, function or method. Um, we won't get into object-oriented uh, notation or anything like that, so I'm going to use function and method interchangeably here. Uh, but we use the, the get command to actually go to the uh, Wikipedia page, Wikipedia server, download the page, and edit and basically uh, create a reference to it and assign to the rec variable. Now, you should have some, ex some program experience for this class, so uh, this shouldn't be uh, very alien to you. Now, the, uh, so let's actually start running these cells, oops, and see what we actually get. Okay, so now that we got the reference, let's see what it looks like. So the, once we uh, evaluate the, the, the reference on the notepad, um, instead of seeing the page, you just see this little representation here. And a lot of, you're going to see this a lot of times where you actually try to evaluate something and you're going to see a structure that kind of looks like this, uh, the open, uh, the greater than, less than, than signs, and something in between. That's just a string representation uh, of the Python object um, that's as associated with that specific, uh, in this case, the, the instance of that class. Uh, a lot of times they're not this helpful. Um, in this case, it's just telling us that basically we got a response from the server and it was a 200 response, which just means that everything went okay. But a lot of times it's just gonna be a reference to where in memory uh, the, the, the object that you're trying, or the property that you're trying to access is. Um, when that happens, it, sometimes it means that you basically are not using the right, uh, uh, um, the right command to actually get the information that you need. Okay, so now that we got the, the rec, command, the rec uh, object created, I'm going to just use this type function, which might be useful for you uh, in the future, to find out what kind of object that is, or in, what, uh, an instance of what class that object actually is. In this case, uh, it's just telling us that it's a response object, 
and uh, I'm sorry, uh, response instance, and um, that basically we can um, do whatever it is that we can do with the uh, response um, objects. Another interesting method that you, that, uh, sorry, uh, interesting function that you have in Python is the dir function. You're going to be using that a lot in the um, in the future probably. It just tells you all of the properties that are um, available for that specific instance. Now, I'm calling these things properties because in Python they're all properties. Some properties are callable, uh, which means that they're actually also can be also referred as methods or, or functions for that um, for that object. But we'll come to that uh, a little later. So in this case, it's telling me that the rack object actually has this information. Now that's all interesting, but what we want is the content of that page. So we want the uh, the actual HTML code that's associated with that page. Um, and to get that, we look at the text property of this, of the, um, the rec uh, object. And we assign it to another variable called page. Okay, so we, we have the output of that page. So it's a fairly long um, string. It has, it's, well, you would imagine the Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia page for, for Harvard's fairly big. And it has all the, uh, the HTML code associated with that page. Okay, cool. So now we have a web page, but the, um, we need to actually get the information, parse it, and just, first of all, get the information that we need, and, uh, and then assign it to, to the structure that we're going to use. Unfortunately, HTML is historically uh, known for being very, um, what can I say, forgiving of, uh, of coding uh, uh, problems. So the browsers, they have come to accept uh, uh, open tags and other things that would usually being valid in, in other languages like XML, for example, or even a, a JSON or some other format that you might deal with. So parsing these things by hand can be a real pain. Um, so searching for, for text inside that, uh, that page could actually take a lot of time and um, not be very um, productive. So there are a bunch of libraries out there that will allow you to, um, to basically parse that, that information without having to manually uh, go and search for the terms that you're, uh, that you're trying to, uh, to extract. Uh, we're going to be using two in the class. One is PyQuery. The other one is Beautiful Soup. This lab only deals with Beautiful Soup and PyQuery. Uh, we address some of it on, the, uh, on homework one. Uh, you're going to see a lot of instructions about how to use it. Uh, but just to, um, to let you know, PyQuery is actually closer to, uh, to jQuery. Um, and it has a syntax that's fairly similar to, to the way that jQuery works. We suggest that if you do have experience with JavaScript and jQuery, uh, you, you might be more, be more uh, comfortable using PyQuery. Uh, if you're more of a Python person, Beautiful Soup is more uh, Pythonic. So you might, be, might want to use that. So as I said, um, we're going to use the uh, Beautiful Soup. And you might have seen in the past, and you've seen it on, on homework 0 and 1, um, sometimes we do import um, and then the library name like we did for requests. And sometimes we do from uh, something import something else, like here. In this case, we're, uh, instead of bringing, uh, uh, basically, we're bringing just the beautiful soup uh, module into our namespace. This makes it easier to, uh, to actually reference uh, uh, functions without having to put the full name. So if you look at the, the full name of the library, sorry. Uh, if you look at how we called requests, uh, we had to put the, the, the library name and then the, uh, the function name. Over here, instead of putting bs4, which is the official name for the library, uh, dot beautiful soup dot something else that I wanted, I can just put the, uh, the, the function name directly because that was actually brought into, the, uh, into our namespace. Okay, so next step is to actually import this library and run the, uh, the soup command. I'm sorry, <laughs> and parse the, uh, the, the page into a soup uh, object. So if we look at the soup um, object itself, it just shows the HTML code again um, that we had for that we have for that page. So that looks very similar to what we have up here. Um, if you look carefully, there are there's one very small difference, basically in the beginning uh, of the, the the string, but otherwise they look very similar. So one thing you can do is make sure that the uh, the two things are actually different. So again, we're going to use the type command to uh, to get the difference between the two. So type page tells us that this is a Unicode, which is the new uh, it's a new Python version for, for a string. Um, so this is a Unicode, uh, basically, object. And this, the soup, is actually a beautiful soup object. So it looks like they're different. Uh, it looks like we're achieving what we wanted, which was to bring that data into a beautiful soup object. Another cool thing that beautiful soup has is the, uh, 
this little method over here um, that allows you to basically print the page, but not in this messy, ugly way. It actually parses and adds um, you know, new lines and everything, and it allows you to basically look at the, the, the source code of the page um, a lot more easily. OK, so if we evaluate this, or if you look at the, the source uh, code on your browser, you're going to see that they're the same page. So we're on our way there. All right, so now that we have the page actually inside the, uh, the beautiful soup object, um, what we, the next step is going to be to actually look at the, the, uh, the different attributes of that page and actually try to extract the information that we want. Uh, there are a few ways to, re to, reference object, uh, to reference the elements of the page. Uh, one of them is using the dot notation. So, for example, you can do soup, which is our uh, object, dot title. It will give us the, um, the HTML title of the page. Now, to be clear, though, uh, when we did the DRR command, you saw that actually shows all of the properties that are um, available for that method. I'm sorry, for that object. So when you do this, it looks like you're actually, that this um, dot title is actually one, a, a, math, uh, a property of that object. However, it is not. Um, if you actually look for the title inside the, uh, the, the, the uh, the list of methods for soup, it is not going to be there. It's just synthetic sugar, uh, sugar that, uh, that the library puts, so you can actually access those, uh, those reference those, those objects like this. I'm sorry, those elements like this. Okay, uh, but this works fine for the title element, which is you can only have one title per HTML page, but what about objects that actually, uh, elements that can actually appear multiple times, like for example, paragraph elements or um, you know, tables or that kind of stuff? Well, if I do the soup.p, I'm actually only going to get the first, uh, the first P element. So that's usually not what you, what you want to do. Uh, usually you want to get all of the elements that are available on the page. So to do that, we use the, the find all command. Now, just to show you that there's a difference, if I do soup, you saw there's just one element here. Um, if I actually get the length of, the, uh, of what's returned by, by find all, we'll see that there are 75 P elements actually on the page. So Again, be careful when you're dealing with, uh, with single elements, the title could be okay, or if you only care about the first instance of an element, um, this can be okay. And we're gonna see later there's another situation where the dot's gonna also work when you're actually uh, specifying the class or some other property of the, uh, of the uh, element. Um, but this is a little clearer and might give you, uh, you know, fewer problems in the future, so you might want to stick with the, the find all. Okay, so we, if we look at the, uh, the page itself, the, um, the Harvard page, uh, we'll see that it has a couple of tables on it. Um, you can either browse to the, pa to the uh, page, or we're gonna show this later, but it, the, the, the page has a few, a few tables with different information about the, uh, the university. So we can see that, um, basically, if I do the soup.table, again, I get the same result as I did with the P. I only get the first table, um, but I can get a, a uh, attribute of, the, um, of that element as well. So we can combine these two things to extract all of the tables that are um, available on that, um, on that uh, uh, page. So we're gonna do a little interlude over here because we're gonna start dealing with list comprehensions. They're very uh, common um, when using Python. So, and they're somewhat they're not unique to Python, but they're not very common. As in, they're not available in C. I don't think they're available in R uh, or many other languages. So um, we're going to just stop a little bit to, do, uh, to talk about list comprehensions. So a list comprehension is just a way to basically do a for loop and at the same time assign the results of that for loop to, or I shouldn't say a for loop, to, to do a loop and assign the results of the loop, uh, that loop to a, um, to a uh, uh, list, uh, Python list. So in this case, and you can do all of that in one line. In this case, we're, um, you can read it this way. We're, this is the four element, so 4t in soup.findAll table. We're gonna take the, the, the table class if only, the, only if the, uh, the class in this case, I'm sorry, if the, uh, the table in this case actually has a uh, attribute of class. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about list comprehensions later. Uh, this is just to, uh, to whet your appetite. So just to show you what we get. Basically, we got a list of lists. So we got a list of all the tables that are available on, that, um, on the page, because we use the find all table. 
Uh, we only extract the ones that actually have a class attribute, which is an HTML, um, actually a CSS uh, property of that element. And then we actually um, get the class itself and assign to these, uh, to these um, uh, lists. So you go, so you get lists, uh, we get individual ones when the, the, um, the element only has one class. And um, basically this shows all the tables that are available there. Looking at this, um, and if you look at the, the, the source code, you see that there's this one table that has the wiki table class is uh, an interesting table. It actually shows the demographics of uh, um, Harvard University. So basically, for undergraduate, graduate students, basically what percentage of uh, which, how the races are represented into uh, those uh, schools or programs, I should say. Um, so, as I said, the, uh, the list, uh, list comprehension itself is similar to basically creating a, um, a list and then manually assigning values to it. So this over here will give you the same result as this cell over here. And we can prove that by running. So you get the same thing. So again, just to make it clear, we create a, uh, a list. We iterate over all the table elements. If that element actually has a class, then we append that, class, uh, we append that element uh, class to this my list um, uh, list. So, but the list comprehension is a lot more concise. Of course, you can do it in one line. Um, just looks nicer. And uh, for some, depend on how much you're iterating, it's actually a little bit more efficient than the uh, than just a regular for loop. There are some other differences in terms of the variables that are created uh, temporarily. But for this class, you don't have to worry about that. Um, you can use either one, whatever makes more sense to you. Uh, we will use. Uh, the, the list comprehension is a lot on homework one, so you might as well just get acquainted to it. Okay, so one thing that I'm gonna do here on the next cell is just basically render the HTML uh, so you can actually see what the page looks like. This is just the table, the, the, um, the code for the table that we were interested in. Uh, I just copied and pasted directly here and I'm using the IPython notebook magic um, HTML which basically means that whatever is on this cell is gonna be rendered as an HTML um, element, uh, an HTML, I guess, document. And this is the page, and I'm uh, sorry, this is the, the table that we see. And again, if you go to the, the web page, you're gonna see the same table there. As I said, it's a demographics table. Uh, it shows the percentage of, of how each, it shows how each uh, of these races are actually represented on Harvard. And the last column is just the US census, um, so the whole country, how those races are represented. Now, this is a simple table, very uh, small one, and you're gonna see that it's not ideal to the kind of uh, data analysis that we're gonna do. So we're gonna do some formatting afterwards. Uh, and the one that you're, gonna, that you're gonna work with on the homework is a lot larger than this. I mean, it has, for each year that you're gonna work with, it has about 100, well, yeah, it has 100 uh, records for each year. The reason I chose this small one is that it makes, you know, it's easier to understand, because you can actually, as I said, see the code and follow the code along fairly easily just by, by looking at it. Uh, and the concepts are the same. Once you can do this one, you can do you know, a list, um, a table with a, with a, a thousand, uh, sorry, a hundred uh, rows, a thousand, doesn't really matter. Okay, so before we can actually put this data into the data frame, which as I said is the pandas, uh, is the, the, the data structure that we're gonna work with most of the times, we have to clean it up and, and basically extract the information that we need. There are a few ways to do this. Uh, what I'm gonna show is more on the functional side of things. Um, Homework one is actually gonna have, uh, gonna have uh, uh, um, instructions on how to do it both ways. Basically, imperative uh, or uh, object-oriented, uh, um, I guess, approach, and more of a functional approach. So in this case, uh, I'm just using the list comprehension to basically find the table um, that has a class of Wikipedia, and then once you find that table, give me all the TR elements. Now you see the difference between the two. Here I'm using find, and here I'm using find all. In essence, the main difference is that find will give me one single element, find all will give me a list of elements. Um, when, in this case, I know from, because we looked at the data before, so I know that there's only one wiki table, uh, one table with a class of wiki table, so I know it's only gonna return one thing. So this is safe. But if that was not the case, and we actually had more than one table, uh, we, I'm sorry, yeah, more than one table with the class of wiki table, uh, the find would only return the first instance of that. So this is also another uh, common pattern on, on Python. Basically, what I'm saying is soup, run this method on soup. So basically, give me, give me this table. And then this is going to return an object, which in turn, I can actually call other functions on. 
which in this case I'm going to call find all uh, the TR elements. Now TR elements are row elements. And this should give me all the rows on the table. And we see that it's true. I get the undergrad, um, graduate, professional, census, and all the other roles with information over here. So it looks weird, but it's, um, it's the, all the information that's in here. OK, cool. So one problem that we're going to have with this thing is that, um, as you can see on the table itself, there's a, there's a, a, a new line between graduate and professional. Now, when you're par parsing your own data, you're going to see a lot of other problems with, the, uh, with your data set that you're going to have to clean manually. Uh, homework one is going to touch upon regular expressions. We're not going to talk about it here because you actually, the, the regular expression that you need for homework one is already there. Uh, you're not going to have to learn anything. But that's the, whenever you get, w when you're dealing with complicated uh, strings, regular expression is the way to go. Over here, we're just going to use simple, simple replacement to remove that new element, uh, new line element, and put something else uh, in its place. In our case, we're just going to replace it with a space. To do that, uh, we are going to use lambda expressions. So you might not, have, might not have used lambda expressions before, but they are, I guess, the equivalent to, well, they're equivalent to functions. So they're to, they are to functions what um, list comprehensions are to the for loops plus you know, adding stuff to, to, the, uh, to an array. Uh, they allow you basically to create a simple function that will, that is one liner, and it, that's what's one of the restrictions. It needs to be a, a single line. And there's no return value or there no explicit return value. It's going to return whatever is evaluated last, uh, whatever is evaluated uh, on that expression. So the syntax is simple. You put lambda, um, a space, and then whatever parameters you need. You can, we're just using one, but it can be as many as you want. And then um, you operate on those parameters and return something to, from that function. So then I'm assigning this to, to a variable. Now, Python, again, we're not going to get too deep into this, but Python, uh, in Python, functions are first class functions. So you can actually assign a function, or in this case, a lambda expression, to a variable. Um, we're going to, again, do that on homework one. But here you just need to, to kind of understand what the lambdas are. Again, we're going to take a little We'll digress a little bit and talk a little bit about functions in Python um, because you will be defining some for, for your homework. So basic uh, function definition in Python, um, aside from the limit expression that we already saw, uh, function definition is done like this. It's def key, uh, a keyword, the name of the function that you want, whatever parameters you want to put in there, and a, the function is going to return something or not. We're going to talk about that later. But in this case, the function returns the uh, x and the two uh, asterisk actually, they allow you to um, to get the exponent. Um, so it's x to the uh, to the y. So here I'm defining the function um, in Python. I mean, you should know this by this time, but uh, by now. But the uh, spaces are important, so there's a little space between the two. And then I'm calling the function with the two numbers two and three. Hopefully, I'll get eight. There we go, and we do. Uh, you can also define a function that takes no arguments. Uh, it can either return something or not. In this case, because it doesn't return anything, it might. If you're, um, you might actually call this a procedure. So functions that don't return anything are, or they used to be called procedures. I guess they're not anymore. But in this case, the function doesn't return anything. Now, be careful though. You might, you're going to see this here, and you're going to see the uh, the eight here. But they're two very different things, and you can see that the uh, the eight has the out, um, I guess, word before it, and the hello doesn't. So print will actually print something to your, your command line or whatever you're calling the function from or you know, uh, your, your notebook or whatever. The 8 being shown here is just something that is returned by this function. And a lot of times you're going to be working with the notebook, and the notebook is nice enough to show you the output. But if you run the same thing on the command line uh, or on an isolated program, you're not going to see anything in there. And you might get confused. But the main reason is that. Basically, the, the notebook will show you the output value of the, uh, the cell. So the last thing that's evaluated on the cell is going to be shown. Uh, and the, um, but the command line, or I should say, when you're running from the command line, it won't. The, in this case, there's, you see no out. So basically, I'm printing hello, but this function, the function itself, or, and the cell, consequently, it does not return anything to us. OK? All right, so get a little more complicated now. The um, one thing that you're going to use a lot with, uh, with pandas is going to be what we call the default arguments. Um, so Default arguments are just you know, what they sound like. Basically, you can, it, we create the, uh, the, the two values as before. But this time, we actually assign a default value for, to y. Um, and then 
In this case, we just get multiple, so um, you'd return x times y. So let's run this and see what happens. All right, when we run it as before, where we actually pass it two values, that's all it does. It basically assigns 10 to, to x, 2 to y, and multiplies it to 2. So you get 20. So when you do x and y. Uh, when you only do one of the arguments, it uses the default value that's, uh, that was already set for, uh, for y. So in this case, it just returns 10, which is 1 times 10. So as I said, this is gonna, you're going to see this a lot, especially when we get down, we're going to see some other edge cases for, for this. Uh, but we're going to use this a lot on pandas. So sometimes you're going to see that you have, uh, you're calling the same func or the same constructor or maybe the same function, and sometimes you're passing one argument, sometimes you pass three, four, uh, or none. And that happens because that function has uh, default arguments um, assigned to it uh, on, upon you know, when it was defined by the library creator. OK, so we can have not, there's nothing restricting us from having more uh, default arguments or default value for the arguments. And this shows basically when I have one regular argument and two arguments that actually have, a, um, that have default values assigned to them. So in this case, what I'm doing here is hi and then the name, which again, it's not optional. You have to put it there because there's no default value assigned to it. And then um, how are you doing this? And then a condition, which is by default such a nice. And then if leaving, so leaving is a Boolean uh, 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 variable. It takes uh, true or false. And then if leaving, then it prints another message. So let's define the function. All right, so when I call it and use all the default values, you're going to get just hi John, so this line, and then how are you doing in this nice day? Because nice was the, what was set up there. If I specify all values, oops, all values, so in this case I'm specifying John, true, and rainy. So I'm replacing this value, which was false, with true, and this one with rainy. Uh, I get the full thing. So hey John, how are you doing this rainy day? And please come back. Now, I can also do, since the third one is actually, uh, the third argument, which is condition, is set to a default value, I can just do this as well, just pass it two arguments. In this case, it's going to replace name, which again is not optional, and it's going to replace leaving with true. So in this case, again, we get the, the default one for condition and um, the non-default one for the other one. All right, but there's an edge case. What about if you want to specify, basically if you want to use the first one, which is not optional, and the last one, but you want to leave the second one uh, with the default value. Uh, that, can, that would be a problem because basically if I just put two, we saw that it actually assigns the second one to the second parameter. So the way to do that is using uh, uh, named parameters. Now there's a, it's a little complicated, well, it can get a little complicated when you're reading about this because named parameter is not the same thing as default value. Default values are, defi are, are part of the definition of the function and name parameters are used when you're calling the function itself. Um, so sometimes you might be reading about this, it might get a little confusing. But what we're doing here is saying, all right, this variable called condition, which is over here, uh, I want to set it to, to horrible. And again, this is, it seems not very important, but it is important to, the, uh, to when you're using pandas because sometimes you're going to be, you know, defi again, defining, uh, uh, just putting values for the variables. Sometimes you're going to actually have to do this something equals something else. All you're doing is you're referring to some to a variable that had a default value before, but you want to replace it. However, it's not in the same order that you're, you're using here. So, all right, so that takes care of uh, default names. Now, there's another one that we're going to use. This is a little more advanced. Might not be, um, w w you're going to see it a few times doing the, the, the homework one, but it's not very uh, used a lot in, actu in actual pan pandas. Uh, and these are the, the variable or uh, um, arbitrary arguments or variable size arguments. In this case here, imagine that I want to basically print a person name and the, the name of the siblings, but I don't know how many siblings are there. Uh, one way to do that is to actually pass a list or some other container to the function. Um, another is to use the, uh, is to actually use uh, this, which is variable uh, length parameters. What this allows us to do is basically pass an arbitrary number of parameters. So again, remember that the first one is actually not optional. You have to do it. And then I can pass as many as I want afterwards. And what Python would do is actually bundle all these things together into a list and make it available to us. So in this case, we're going to print the name, which is this guy. And then for each sibling inside the siblings uh, 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 list, which was just created for us, uh, we're going to print the name of that sibling. So again, look at this. We're calling with four parameters. Here we're calling with two and then with one. 
And we get what we would expect, well, from the code above. Basically, we're iterating over the list and get, give, giving all the, uh, the, the names from there. Uh, so again, just to, be, to make it drive it home, basically what this does is aggr uh, it's group the, uh, the parameters that you pass into a list and pass that list to the, uh, to the function. We're going to use that in a second, and you're going to see it on homework two as well. I'm sorry, homework one. OK, the last one is actually the um, uh, keyword parameters. So keyword parameters actually have two asterisks before it. And it's similar to the variable. It's actually a mix of the named um, parameters and the, uh, the variable length parameters. Basically, what it allows you to do is pass arguments like this, where you pass on a key value um, uh, fashion. Uh, again, this is actually you're going to it, because it's behind the scenes, you're not going to know that this is actually a keywords value, a keywords parameter, and not a def uh, name parameter. But as you can see, you pass them the same way, but they do operate a little bit differently. Basically, what this does is whatever you pass it here, again, with a key value pair, so key equals some value, uh, is going to get passed to the function as a dictionary. And we're going to talk a little bit about dictionary dictionaries later. But um, this allows you to, in this case, we're iterating over the dictionary, and we're actually getting the, the key value and then the value associated with that key. By the way, there are other ways to do that um, to actually get the value and the key, but for, to keep it simple, we're going to just do it like that now. So if I do this, there you go. I actually get the key value and whether it's a brother or a sister. All right, last thing. You might want to combine all of these things together. So you might want to combine um, regular arguments with optional arguments or uh, default arguments and with uh, variable and keyword arguments. You can definitely do that. The only thing to keep in mind is that when you're creating your function, it has to follow this order. The first ones, they need the, the, um, the regular arguments need to come first, then the named arguments or um, the default arguments, and then the, uh, the variable and then the keyword arguments. So that's it for, for functions for now. That should be enough for you to go through, through homework one. OK, so now going back here, um, so now we're going to actually split the data. Uh, if you remember before, we actually used the list comprehension to, uh, to basically create those, um, the rows. And we created a lambda expression to replace the new, the new line um, characters with a space. Okay, so now we're going to actually use that. This was the lambda function that we created. And what we're doing is we're calling it with the text that's going to be associated with that uh, HTML um, tag. Or element, I should say. So the HTML element is going to have the tag themselves, so the opening and closing tags, and there's going to be some text in between. And we're passing that text into um, that lambda function. And the result of that lambda function is what's going to go into the, 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 the list that's going to be generated from this. Uh, we're iterating over only the first row. And that's one thing to keep in mind. Unlike R or MATLAB uh, or Julia, uh, indexing in Python starts uh, at 0 and not at 1. So the first element is uh, element 0. And we're saying find all the th, which is a table header, uh, if that th actually has text associated to it. So to explain why we're doing this somewhat complex thing, let's go back up to the table. And what we're doing there, we're just trying to get the column names. That's why we're iterating only over the first row. So we only care about the first row that, was that is on that object, which is this guy over here. We also don't care about this column over here, because it's just separating these two things. So that's why we, we were, one of the things that we, we told the list comprehension is only return the values, uh, only return the, uh, the text, or I should say the elements, uh, that actually have text associated with them. So, and that's what that if statement, somewhere, here you go, that if statement actually does. So if there is text in there, uh, return the column. Now, I believe, I talked about this, yeah. So I talked about this a little bit on this text, but basically uh, one thing to know about Python is that Boolean tests, um, they are not weird, but they, they behave in a peculiar way. Uh, basically, zero, false, uh, the none object, um, and empty, well, an empty string and any other empty containers are considered false in, uh, in Python. So whenever I get, uh, in, uh, evaluate these things over here, they evaluate to false. The, um, anything else? So uh, a list that actually has elements on them, uh, non-empty string, a number, whatever, it's going to be evaluated true. And of course, true itself is going to be evaluated true to true. That can be very tricky when you're dealing with uh, some complex objects, and you don't know if it's going to be evaluated as true or false. So um, 
unless you're dealing with you know, one of these simple cases, uh, it's easier to, it's safer to just basically do a, a, a full comparison uh, of the object to something else. So this would be equivalent to saying um, this. So in this case, we're doing the explicit comparison. We say, all right, give me uh, if this thing is different from, from an empty string, then I want you to return that. The, uh, in that case, you know, we, it's actually, this comparison is going to return either true or false, the real true or false value. And it's, if the, the function fails, basically, we are not going to get that column. So there you go. So this generates the things that we want. Again, if you look at a graduate and professional, it doesn't have the new line anymore, because we actually use that lambda function to remove that and place a space in there. OK, next step is going to be to get the indexes. Now, the indexes, or what I'm calling indexes here, uh, are actually these guys. So they're in the index for the, uh, for the rows themselves. And all right. So same concept. Basically, we are um, simply looking at you know, the, uh, the, each one of those rows, and we're iter iterating over them and just getting the, uh, the first element of them. Now, one thing you should keep in mind here. First of all, I'm going from the first element to the last. This is called a uh, list or I should say container slicing, and the, the little column over here. And it means give me from this element to you know, some other element that I can put in here. In this case, when you leave the second element free, it's just give me all the elements from the first to the, uh, to the uh, in this case, from the second to the end of the, uh, of the list. Um, one other interesting thing is, remember I told you uh, that basically if you use the find all, you're going to get all the th elements from that thing. But if you use just find, you're going to get just the first one. In this case, we only care about the first one because this thing actually has a lot of th in there, one for each one of these cells. So one th here. Oh, actually, I stand corrected. In this case, it only has actually one. It only has four the, the, the row. Um, but if you had more, or if this guy was actually set as a TD, which is another way, it's the way to set the cell, uh, we, can, we would be able to just get the first one, which would be the first row, I'm sorry, the uh, first column value, by using just the find instead of the find all. All right, in the end, we have the indexes, and that's what matters. Here, we're just creating another um, uh, lambda function. Uh, this time, it's going to be to remove the percent sign from the values on the cells. Now, the cells themselves, they had um, the, the percentage, so they had you know, 15% or something like that. So what we're doing here is removing that, that uh, percent sign and actually transforming that number into an integer. Now, this is another construct that you're going to see on homework one, uh, and you're going to see in a lot of Python code on the wild. Uh, which is using comparison, so and and or, to actually eval evaluate to a real, uh, to a specific value. So Python, basically, it has short-circuited uh, and, or, and not. Well, not doesn't matter. But anyway, it has and and or short-circuit. Uh, so basically, what this means is that if you're doing an and comparison and the first element is false, the second element is never evaluated. So um, only this one is. If it returns false, it's, the other one is not, not evaluated. Now, for the or, it's the other way around. If this is evaluated and it's, fall, and it's true, then the second one is never evaluated. So basically, it does the least amount of work. Um, for the end, if the first one is false, then there's no need to check the second, because the whole uh, evaluation is going to be false. And for the or, the, the other way around. The first one is true, doesn't need to evaluate the second. Uh, another thing to keep in mind here is that the end uh, takes precedence over the or. So, so let's try to explain what's going on here. What we're looking at is I want to see the last element of, that set, of the, uh, the value from that cell. So I'm sorry, from the value that I'm, I'm looking at. So if we look at the table, the last element for the values over here is the percent sign. Okay. So we're looking at that. If it is a percent sign, this is going to return true. That's fine. What's going to happen next is going to try to evaluate the second one to see, all right, this is true. Is this going to be true or not? Now, what, I'm, what we're doing here is we're looking at from the first element to the last, but not including the last, because um, that's another thing about the slices in Python is that they are uh, open on the, um, on the uh, upper uh, bound. So basically, when you're indexing from the first element to, let's say, the third, it only includes the first the sec and the second, but the third is not included. So um, in this case, we're saying, Give me the elements up to the last one, but not the last one. And again, just one more thing about the indexing. 
Uh, negative indexes are allowed in Python, um, which is, again, not available in every language. But they work as you would expect. Ne negative one is the last element, negative two, the next to last, and all of that. What we're doing here is give me everything. So basically, give me everything up to that percent sign and try to transform it into an integer. The, um, the result of this is basically, if these two, remember, if this is true, so if the last one was a percent sign, then I'm going to try to transform the numbers before that into an integer. Uh, that's going to return an integer to me. The way that Python um, uh, does this type of evaluation is it, instead of returning true or false from this, compare, from this uh, expression, it actually returns the value uh, evaluated last. So in this case, the value, the value from this uh, function, the return value, is going to be the number generated by the string. So this basically, all of this thing is just generating that uh, integer. And then I have an or none here. So basically, what I'm saying is, if this is false, or if this is false, then it's going to try to evaluate the last value. Because again, as we said, the or only evaluates the last one if the first one is false. In this case, it's going to say, all right, or none. And it's just going to return that value into the, um, to the uh, expression. So it will make more sense once we actually use this. The main reason for doing this is because we have this guy over here. So this doesn't have a, a, a percent sign in the end. So the, the first check, which is the end, will fail. And then it's going to go to the last one, which is the or none. So in this case, for this value, it's going to return a none. Um, because this is a very simple table, there, there are easier ways to do this. Uh, the only reason we show that to you is because homework, as I said, homework one will have an instance of this uh, where it actually it's not that simple to, to, um, to fix the problem without using a construct somewhat like this. All right. So again, just as before, nothing new here. Uh, I'm applying the, the lambda function, the lambda expression to the, uh, to the text value that I get from here, so to the individual cells. Uh, and I'm iterating through the rows, but I don't care about the first row anymore. So I'm going from the second to the last one. And I'm trying to say, all right, I want all of the, the TD elements that are, that are in there. Now, you see that there are two fours over here, so four in and then four in. Uh, this is perfectly valid for, for list comprehensions. You can have as many as you want, although going beyond two can get very complicated to understand. So um, basically, we're iterating over two, two things at the same time. So basically, the first one will return to us a list, uh, or a list like a container-like element. And then we're iterating through that container uh, all at once. And we're also parsing all at once. So there you go. What we get is a big list of numbers. So these are integers, and the last one being a none. And you see why we did the none later on. It's going to be going to help us out. OK, um, so this thing, I'm actually not going to go over it um, because it gets complicated. Just know that the zip function, there's some explanation here of what the zip function does. Basically, when you get two or more uh, 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 iterables, it will give the combinations of the two. So the first and first, second and second, and so on. Uh, it actually returns a, a list of tuples. Uh, tuples are just immutable uh, lists. Um, for our purposes, you can treat them as lists, except that you can't assign anything to them. You can remove values, you can change values, or anything like that. OK, uh, so in the end, what this will do, and you can, uh, with the explanation you should be able to follow by yourself, is it's going to group those uh, numbers into little groups for each one of the, uh, of the rows that we have uh, on the original table. All right, now we have a very nice list of tuples with the uh, group data. Now, there's a section here about talking about the asterisk when it's used like this, so when it's used on a function call. We saw the asterisk before when it was used for the variable arguments, but that was in the function definition. When you use it when you're calling the function, it has actually the opposite effect. Uh, instead of giving you, uh, well, when we did the function definition, what it did was it got all the arguments that we had and bundled them into a list, uh, and then gave, gave that list into the function. Now, when you do it here, it's going to do the opposite. It's going to actually explode those things and transform this list, because you remember the, the, the list comp Oops, that's not good. The list comprehension gives a, uh, returns a, uh, a list. So uh, what it's going to, uh, to do here is basically explode that into individual um, arguments. And we go quickly about it. You know, let's say you have a function like this that expects three arguments. Uh, you can call it like this. And basically, if you call it with numbers, it's going to give you the, it's going to just pass the numbers. All it does is just print the arguments that you pass in. Uh, if you call it with, with lists, it's just going to pr print the lists. Sometimes, as in that, that case, I actually have a list of the arguments that I need. There are a few ways to actually handle this. Uh, the hard way would be like this, which is OK for, for three arguments. But if you have you know, hundreds, not very feasible. Uh, and then I could just call the function normally. 
The other one is actually to do uh, un uh, unpacking the, uh, the ver with the, 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 the list elements, which again, it's a very interesting construct for, uh, on Python. Basically, it assigns this, uh, the elements from the list in order to the variables. You can have more elements on parameters and there are variables are just gonna be ignored, but not the other way around. You need to have at least the same amount of parameters as uh, uh, variables. So if you have more variables, that's gonna generate an error. Uh, this should work as well, but then, the nicest way to do it is actually with the, uh, with the parameter explosion. I like to call it parameter explosion. I don't know what the exact name is, but um, this gives us the same result. So basically, it split up those things into uh, actual um, parameters. Now, by the way, just to show, if I actually had called this with the, uh, oops, print args, with just parameters straight here, it would, it would fail because it's saying, it's being actually telling me exactly why it failed. It's saying, I expect three arguments, you only gave me one. We only gave it one list. Uh, it doesn't care that there are th three elements in there. Um, I only passed one list to it, so. And yeah, that's it for, for explosion. You might see, um, you're definitely gonna see it on homework one, uh, but you might see it also on code on in the wild. Okay, uh, so we talked about dictionary, uh, sorry, list comprehensions. Um, here, I'm just showing that you can kind of do the same thing for dictionary, with dictionaries. Uh, in this case, instead of the square brackets, you have the curly brackets, and you pass a key and a value, and that's gonna create a dictionary. Uh, I'm just, in this case, zipping the columns and the stacked values that I had before, and basically, this just gives me all the, the, each one of the columns, and then the values that are associated with that column. Um, so again, call, it's gonna come from columns, and then the value is going to come from here. Um, there's a better explanation or more lengthy explanation of this on homework one as well. And we're going to use it soon to actually do something useful. Okay, so next step to actually jump into data frames. Um, so this is the data structure that we're going to use the most in the class. Uh, they're going to be, there's going to be another session next week uh, about using data frames. Um, right now we're just going to touch on the, uh, the basic concepts. So to create the data frame, the, the basic way to, to call the data frame constructor is with this. So you pass some values. Again, as you can see, this is a, we're just passing the values without any uh, named arguments. We pass the columns that we want and we pass the indexes. A lot of times you're not gonna pass the indexes themselves. They, you're just gonna let the data frame actually have the index from, from zero to the length of that, uh, length minus one of that thing. But in this case, because I just want to replicate what the table looked like, um, I actually pass the index and this is what the table looks like. I'm sorry, the uh, data frame looks like. It actually looks a lot like the table that we had before. And it, there's a lot of work to actually just get to the same place, but uh, we're gonna see that there's some interesting things that we can do with the data frame. Okay, um, there are other ways to create data frame. This is just one of them. Another way that uh, is actually to use a, uh, a list, um, or basically a list of dictionaries to create each one of those rows. Uh, so the first thing that we do here is use the list comprehension. As you can see, there's a list comprehension inside a dictionary comprehension. So that's gonna create a list of a bunch of dictionaries. And again, it, you know, it looks complicated, but if you look at it, you know the th theory from, from before, you should be able to make sense of everything. Uh, but basically, it just gives us a list with a dictionary for each one of the, uh, of the rows, uh, with the column assigned to, to each one of those values. And then to create it, same thing. Now, instead of actually passing the columns, I don't need to anymore because they're already associated with each one of the values. All I need to do is pass the indexes and we get the same result. Uh, you see that the order is a little bit different. Uh, that's because dictionaries are unordered. So um, that actually might, sometimes actually on other homeworks, you might actually uh, be relying on the order of the dictionary and it's unordered. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then a third way to do it is to actually pass a dictionary of lists. So before we use the list of dictionaries, now we pass a dictionary of lists. Uh, the first thing I need to do is group the, uh, the elements in a different way. Before I have them grouped by, uh, by uh, column, now I'm gonna actually group them by rows. So each one of these lists now inside the main list represent a row. And we uh, then, again, do the opposite of what we did before. Basically assign these things to um, I assign each one of the, uh, of the lists to one of the columns. And there we go, we end up with the same result. Okay, so, but anyway, we didn't assign this to anything, it's just different ways to do the same thing. Uh, if you remember, the data frame looks something like this. Uh, let's look at the types though. We did transform these things into integers, so uh, we just need to make sure that they are actually, they were imported as integers. And I said there's something weird here, the float was actually not imported as an integer, it was uh, imported as a, a 
uh, float 64. I'm sorry, the US Census was imported as a float 64 value. Uh, the reason for this is because of this guy over here. Uh, if you remember, we had assigned none to the international students on the US Census, because that was, used to be an NA, NA value on the uh, table. And the, uh, when it was imported, um, uh, the, the, the pandas could not infer the, uh, the, the data type. So it actually transformed it into a, a float instead of, uh, instead of an integer. So there are a few ways that we can actually fix this. Uh, one way, when you have a lot of data, uh, might be to just drop the, the, the rows that actually have uh, NA values on them. And that's one way to do it. Uh, and you can just lose that, um, that row. Or you might want to do the same thing, depending on your data set, with the column itself. So instead of losing the row, I actually lose the whole column that, that has an NA. So if you remember, the US Census has an NA value, and I can drop the whole column. Uh, by default, most of the functions that operate on, uh, on the, a whole series, so uh, either a, a row or a column, they operate on the, the, the row level before. So that's, that consider, that's considered x is zero. Uh, x is one will be, okay, do this, this function, but on the, um, on the column um, axis. Okay, so, but in this case, uh, the NA here just means that there are zero students because the US Census doesn't count, well, international people because, well, I guess they're not residents. So uh, they do, it doesn't make sense to, to count them on the US Census. So in this case, we can just replace that number with zero, and we should be fine. Again, it's a percentage, so, so we're going to do two things. We're going to use the fill NA to replace that value with a zero. Uh, and if there were other NA values, that they will all be replaced with zero. And we're going to actually reformat that, that, uh, the data frame to only have integer types. And there we go. So we have a zero here. And to make sure that everything's OK, we have int64 for all of those values. Again, you're going to see that on the homework. It's going to be a little more complicated there. It's going to be. Pandas are going to import everything as a, a lot of things as a, an object. You're going to have to do a lot more parsing. But the concepts are the same. Basically, you're just changing from one type to the other. OK, and as I said, one, the, the data frame has some cool uh, properties. One of them is that you actually have functions that allow you to, to get some statistical um, uh, information out of it. So in this case, we see the standard deviation for you know, the undergraduates and everything and all for, for the columns. By def it's just going to show column-wise um, the, the, the ranks and everything. So. OK, so uh, another topic to go through really fast is NumPy. Uh, Pandas itself is built on top of NumPy. Uh, the main function of NumPy is actually to create special data uh, uh, types that are more, they're necessary to do numerical calculations. But it also has a bunch of functions that will be useful, that we will be using in the future, um, which uh, allows us to, to basically do um, vectorized operations, statistical analysis, and other things. Uh, the, if you, to see how they, they're actually related, if you do the DF clean, which is this data frame over here, the, the last one that we created, and we get the values out of there, it actually creates an array of arrays, uh, so a two-dimensional two array or matrix. Um, and if you look at the type of this, it's actually a num, uh, NumPy and the array. So, uh, so basically what I'm getting here is, uh, is that the pandas actually uses NumPy in the, in the, uh, you know, underneath everything. And again, you can actually have, uh, you can run the same functions. Uh, you have some statistical functions that uh, you can run using the NumPy library, um, or NumPy. Some people call it NumPy, or it's called NumPy. So, uh, but basically, it kind of works the same way. Uh, one cool thing about this is that these functions are most of the time, most of them are vectorized. So you can actually apply them to, in this case, I'm applying to the whole data set, uh, so to the whole data frame, and it's just giving me, you know, it's not operating cell on the, the cell level; it's actually operating on the uh, on the column level here. All right, um, one last uh, topic before we close this is indexing. So data frame indexing is very important. Uh, on the next section, you're going to talk, uh, there's going to be some more talk about it. Uh, the basic index to actually, one, one way you can do it to get the columns is to use the dictionary syntax, which is basically just put a bracket and the name of the column that you want. Another way is using the dot syntax. Uh, the dot syntax is nice, and I think it's cleaner. The problem is if you have spaces, like for example with the US Census thing, uh, or sometimes you might have a special character or something like that, the dot is not going to work. Um, so sometimes you're going to have to use this. Plus, when you're trying to do this programmatically, uh, you can actually, this is just a string, so you can assign this programmatically to, you know, to iterate over it. Um, but that's to get actually the column. To get to specific roles, uh, you have a set of other uh, uh, functions that you need to call. Uh, the basic one is lock uh, for location. And in this case, it allows us to put the name of a role, uh, of an index. Uh, remember, we actually use named indexes here. A lot of times, it's going to be just a numerical index. Uh, but when you do the lock, 
it gives you the row for, for, uh, that you, you know, you're calling. So it gives you all the columns for that row. Uh, equivalently, you can use iLock. Uh, iLock will give you the row at that index. So in this case, iLock will give you the first row, which should be the same as that one, and it is. Um, if you remember, Asia Pacific was the uh, first row that we had there. Um, another one that you should not use, but I'm going to show just to, uh, uh, you know, to be complete, but is the IX. So IX is a mix between uh, lock and iLock, and it accepts either a uh, label or an index name uh, or a number, so an index position. Uh, and you can actually, there are some advent, uh, there's disadvantages to using IX. One of them is it's slower. It also has some edge cases where it doesn't work as you would expect. So if possible, use lock and iLock. Uh, you can, if you want a reference to a specific cell, uh, you can actually do uh, that with either one of those commands. So lock, you just give it the, in this case, I'm giving the row and the column that I want, and you give me the value from there. Uh, with iLock, I, I want, in this case, the fourth um, row and the, first, and the second column and give them the same thing. And with IX, I can actually mix the two things. But again, it seems nice, but don't use it. OK, um, group by, and we'll finish this soon. Uh, so the group by, you're going to see that uh, um, on future homeworks. This is a complex topic. Um, basically, don't worry about this first cell. Uh, what I'm doing is just expanding that cell into uh, that data frame so it actually has the you know, numerical uh, uh, indexes, and uh, uh, the columns are actually more complete. And then I can actually use the group by to group this data again. Again, this is very contrived. You don't need to do this because we already had that information. Uh, but here I'm showing that the group by, you can actually create the groups based on what I called here. I changed the names for the columns. One is raised, the other one is source, the one is, other one is percentage. Uh, and you can do that. Now, one thing to keep in mind, groups, group data, is, they're not data frames anymore. They're the special data type called data frame group by. A lot of people try to do head or try to do some other things that they would be able to do on a data frame, and they can't with the group by data, and um, that's why. So basically, before you get back to a data frame, you have to perform some aggregate operation on it. In this case, we're performing the mean, and we're getting the mean from each one of these, uh, uh, of these groups. So again, these were the groups that I had, and these are the means, the, the percentage means. <laughs> uh, and if I get the type of this, OK, so now this is back to a data frame. So again, just keep in mind, group by, data, group by objects are not the same as data frames. OK. Um, all right. So Last thing, you can, actually, can also iterate over the groups by using this, um, just a regular for loop. So you iterate over the name and the group. This is going to give you, in this case, print in the name, print the group itself. Um, but that's about it. Um, it allows you a lot of control when you use that way. OK, so the real last thing will be this, which is just showing that uh, Pandas also has a, some very basic plotting capabilities. Most of the time, we're going to be using matplotlib, uh, and you're going to learn that in future lessons. There are going to be you know, actually classes about visualization. Uh, but or Seaborn, we're also going to use that. But for simple plots, uh, you can sometimes do it with, uh, with uh, pandas. OK, so that should be enough for your first homework. And um, well, if you have any questions, just talk to your TA or post it on Piazza. Thank you.